were completed, that he departed to his own house. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid her she hid her, herself five months, saying, Thus, the Lord has dealt with me in these days. He looked on me to take away my reproach among people. So, there's several details we want to pull out of there. But, uh, let's go to his wife. So, his wife, Elizabeth, as we just read there, uh, what did she do when she found out she got pregnant? Yeah, she hit herself. Right. Why? Huh? Too old to have a kid. Oh, Mike's going the right path here. Think about it. If you're advanced in years and you got a baby, you're going to have people fawning on all over you the whole time. And this was a miracle child. She was barren. She couldn't have kids all this time. And all of a sudden, she, she got pregnant, and God gave her this, this wonderful gift, and... During this time, though, something else was happening, okay? So I'm just, I'm setting a little bit of a backstory here, and many of us know these stories, which is fine, but there's some details, I think, that we're going to bring out that may shock a few people. So let's jump over to Mary. So we have Elizabeth, she's now pregnant, her, her husband is mute, which may have been, I don't know, a blessing or a curse, I can't really, I don't really know <laughs> Zacharias, quite frankly, uh, but they're in situation where now she she is pregnant but now also let's I guess not even fast forward but let's go somewhere else and there's another angel talking to Mary and this is in Luke so this is Luke 26 and this just continues on now in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent so this was in the sixth month of what Perfect. Thank you. By the way, you're inspired this. This is your fault. <laughs> just, just so you guys know, like him and I, we, uh, he sent me a message and we, were, we went back and forth about some of the details around Jesus' birth and all this stuff. And we were just bouncing messages back and forth and back and forth. And it was like an impromptu Bible study. And so he got me digging into this deeper and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> he sent me down this giant rabbit trail about Jesus, the details of Jesus' birth. So um, hopefully, like I said, hopefully we're going to have some fun with this. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth. Okay, so this was in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. So she was well along. Now, verse uh, 27. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come to the angel, said to her, Rejoice! Highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. This is verse 29. But when he saw him, I'm sorry, when she saw him, she was troubled at, at his saying and can, I'm sorry, and considered what the matter of the greeting was. This was. Okay, why did she freak out, by the way? An angel? What did you say, Candy? She wasn't married, right? But up, up to this point, all she's done is just seen the angel. Story? Um, when, uh, uh, when you were, like, mm-hmm. Um, you were, like, right. What it would be like to see have an angel come before you. But if, if Mary knew the stories... Sometimes when angels come, it's bad news. <laughs> okay? Sometimes when angels come, they give reproach. They give correction. It, it, like she knew the history of, of when angels came. Greg, do you have some? Right. She was a teenager. Right. She was just a teenager. What was that? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So let's continue on. Verse 29. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his, at his saying and considered that, I'm, I'm sorry, considered what manner of greeting this was. When the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you are, you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in, the, in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great 
and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the, and the Lord God will give him the throne of, um, of his father David. Thir- verse 33. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can, I, how can this be since I have not known a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is not, uh, I'm sorry, and this is now the sixth month for her who will be called barren, or who was called barren. Verse 37, for with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now Mary aroused in those days, arose in those days, and went into the hill country with haste to the city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the, the greeting of Mary that the baby leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me? that the mother of my Lord should come to me. For indeed, as soon as the voice of your, I'm sorry, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. Verse 44, Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Okay, so we have, this is the sixth month. And so I'm, I'm just going to go through some of the details. Some of these details you may know, you may not know. Some of these things you may go, wow, I never thought of it that way. So this is the sixth month. This was in Nazareth, okay? So she was in Nazareth. Obviously, she was betrothed to who? Joseph, yeah? So Joseph was probably at this time, so it was Jew, it's Jewish culture, okay? So story, if you were to be betrothed in the Jewish culture at that time, what would happen is, the man that you were betrothed to, you were considered married. For all intents and purposes, you were married, okay? But just not living together and, and doing the deed because the, married, the marriage act, you know, the, the, the ceremony hadn't taken place. But what would happen is the man would go to his home and he would tack on an addition to his family's home. So it would either be a, a, a home within the courtyard. So the way that families used to work back then, I wish I had a picture for this one. This would, it would be great. The way the families worked back then is they would build homes around usually a central courtyard. That's the way they would do the homes. That or they would tack on to other homes that were already there because some of the families were so large. So the Becker family, the way they would do it is Jasper would build an addition on when he was going to get married. He would build an addition on or up or however the, the topography of the land would work at that time. And what would happen is I, as the father, uh, father father-in-law actually, I, as the father-in-law, would have to approve his addition to the home before he could go out and grab his bride. This is also prophetic, and I want everybody to understand this. Remember when Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Yeah, that's important. That's, that, that'll preach right there. Okay? Jesus is going to prepare a place for you, but guess who has to approve when he can go and grab his bride? The father, yes. Oh, sorry, just got goosebumps. The father has to come out and say, listen, it's time. The home is ready. Jasper, you can now go and get your bride. Jesus, go get your bride. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, So the father has to inspect it. The the father has to be involved in this. Uh, They were already considered married at this time, but the Holy Spirit, when, when it says the Holy Spirit came over her, okay, this word, and I, and I looked it up, and please don't let me say it. It's, it's difficult. Uh, but the word that they used overshadowed, okay? That's the same word that's used in a few other places in Scripture. Remember when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration with the disciples? 
And they said, and they looked up, and they were, Jesus was overshadowed, or some say a cloud, or some say, uh, I don't know, there's, there's probably about three or four different versions that are like that. It's the same verbiage of the Holy Spirit in clouding, in shrouding, just completely engulfing. It's also, the similar phrase is in creation. When the Holy Spirit was hovering over the face of the waters, or in shadowing over the face of the water, engulfing the, sh- the face of the waters, it was a phrase that meant to, to literally meant just completely engulfed and surrounded by the Holy Spirit. And we find that in Genesis as well. So she was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. Now, the reason I bring this up is because there are a lot of skeptics that uh, come out, and the skeptics all talk about, well, how, how could she be born, and, or how could, how could she give, uh, be conceived by, by herself? Well, she wasn't by herself. It was the Holy Spirit that did this. Uh, it was a miracle, and that's the point. And there's still a lot of arguments and, con- and contentions with this um, so much so, and I'll get into some of the details in just a minute. Uh, but remember, Elizabeth was... Okay. Yeah, shoot. Yeah, go for it. Did the Holy Spirit have to do the deed, or did the Holy Spirit touch her stomach? The Holy Spirit would have miraculously... See, when it comes to a woman... So we'll, we'll, we'll get into the biology right now. Here we go. Uh, when it comes to a woman having a child, the... If the genetic makeup of that child is messed up, the woman's body will reject it. That's biology. It, this is, it's to prevent defects, genetic defects and stuff like that. It's just it's the way that it is. If the conceived body will, is messed up, is not genetically similar to the mother, then guess what? The body's rejected. The baby's rejected. Okay, it's very sad. But, so, so uh, let me phrase that. Let's back up. So, according to Jesus, all the, G- the only genetic makeup that Jesus ever needed was half of Mary's, and her body would have accepted him. She would have been perfectly fine. So the Holy Spirit, and that, this is the miracle, the Holy Spirit, all that, that, all that Jesus' genetic makeup needed was an X chromosome to make him male and to get this thing working. That's it. He didn't need DNA from God. But I think, that, I think that's a good question, though. That's a really good question. So, and we'll get into that a little bit because later on we're going to talk about, um, which, by the way, I, just, I, I want to make this kind of kind of clear. We'll go into it right now. The virgin birth is not the miracle. I know it's always the thing that we say. Oh, virgin birth, right? That's not the miracle. It's the virgin conception that's the miracle. The thing that you're just talking about right now, Mike. That's the miracle. Because... And this is this is where the and I didn't I didn't even know this, but science is is I don't know, crazy sometimes. It's nuts. They said, well, technically it's possible for a, a woman to conceive as a virgin on her own. Technically it's possible. And let me go through the numbers with you very quickly. All, there are out of all of the known people that have ever lived, which is roughly 30 billion people, there's a possibility for Two women to have been born. Two. Out of 30 billion people, out of all the span of time, okay, that could have been born with an X and a Y chromosome and still been fertile and still had the, had the, the possibility of spreading on um, an X and Y chromosome to have a child, to have a male child. Two out of 30 billion people. That's the possibility that science puts in, out there to try to negate the miracle of, of the virgin conception. They, truly. They really, really do. Two out of 30 billion. Thank you, Mason. That's... Yes. So remember Elizabeth, up to this point, up to this point, nobody knows that Elizabeth is pregnant. But then Gabriel spills the beans to Mary. It says, Mary, hey, go on, go out there. You have... You have to go, or actually, she, he didn't command this, but she went out because she found out her cousin uh, Elizabeth was pregnant. So she traveled. Uh, by the way, it's about a week. It was about a week's journey to travel to Elizabeth. So what we find, though, is, remember, Elizabeth was how far along? Six months. This is going to come up later. Mary was already pregnant 
And this is what we're going to find in, in just a minute. Mary didn't even have to say anything to Elizabeth because the Holy Spirit. Because understand, up to this point, Mary didn't go out and shout it to the mountaintops that she was going to have the Savior. No, it's Elizabeth was, was pregnant. Six months later, the same messenger goes out to Mary and says, hey, your cousin's pregnant, by the way. And by the way, you're going to have the Savior. And so she runs over there, right? Six months into the pregnancy, which this is going to come, this is going to come a little bit later. And this is in Luke 56. So just, this is Luke, 5, Luke 1, 56 and 57. And Mary remained with her, meaning Elizabeth, about three months and returned to her house. Why would she remain with her for three months? Absolutely. John the Baptist was coming in three months. She was six months along. What's six plus three? Nine months. Usually takes about nine months to make a baby. So, yeah, she was there. She was there to help her cousin. But the moment, check this out, the moment that John was born, she booked at home. Okay, ladies, I don't have much experience in this outside of my two children, but I've never been pregnant. I have been told, according to the medical professionals, that ladies with their first child are usually showing, begin to show the baby bump, at three months. Mary would not have had to have hid anything up to this point. She would have just began to show. Now, mind you, we has anybody, anybody seen the movie The Star? Yeah, we just watched it last night. It's, it's a cartoon, and it's about the birth of Jesus. It's actually, it's pretty cute. They're off on, on several details, but it's cute. It talks about, you know, the, it, it, it tells the story basically from the donkey's perspective of, you know, the donkey that carried Mary. Okay, I get that. It's not in Scripture, but not the point. Uh, but it, it tells it from that perspective. And this is why, actually, why, why I'm glad we watched it last night. Maybe you guys can see some inconsistencies with it. So she was with Elizabeth until John was born. She was to be married and had to hurry back home. So think about this perspective here, guys. She is a teenager who obviously knows she's pregnant, She's had three months to know that she is pregnant, okay? And she has not told her husband-to-be yet. Kind of getting the picture here? I want you to feel this. She's a teenager that is betrothed to somebody who is knowingly pregnant, who has not talked to her husband, or soon-to-be husband. They didn't have cell phones back then. <laughs> so, this might become an issue very, very quickly. Very, very quickly. And obviously it did. So let's jump to Matthew very quickly. This is Matthew 1, 18. So this is after the begots. Now the birth of Jesus was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together. So this is telling the, the story from the way that Matthew wrote it. So obviously the de some of the details in, in Luke are not going to be in Matthew. Some of the details in Matthew are not going to be in Luke. Okay, So just understand we have two different authors here. Uh, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take, to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Okay, I could preach on Emmanuel all day. I love that phrase. Uh, for, for those of you who are, who are younger and may, may not have experienced or studied other religions, 
all, almost all other religions, even some Christian religions, do not put God with us. God is placed far, far out there and he is unobtainable. You cannot reach him. You can pray and, and take a gamble, roll some die and, and hope and pray that God listens to it. But no, the God of the Bible states, Emmanuel is with us. So he was preparing a place during this time. And Mary was already three months along and anxious to tell him. Okay? Ta-da! We're already there. And obviously he, he has a problem. So what's going on? Why? She's already, she's already this far along and he's, he's just, ah, uh, he's, he's not understanding. And I think, quite frankly, remember in the movie, guys, he was very anxious. He didn't understand what was going on. I was trying to put all this together. I, I totally understand a man going through that God would have needed to send an angel to him to, to clarify some of this. So let's talk about the birth. This, is, this one's going to be the fun one because this is where I think a lot of us Christians get this wrong. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> so in Luke 2, 1 through 7, it says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, that all the world should be registered. This census first took place with uh, Quirinius, was governor of Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, this betrothed wife who was with child. So it was that while they, were, while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. That's important, by the way. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. More than likely, both of them hung out in Nazareth for, for a little while because it just says in those days they had a census, okay? Census back then were not a, a one or two month thing. If a king was doing a census, it, it took a while. It took a long time because you're talking about, number one, getting the word out to your whole country. Number two, everybody's got to now make plans and shift everything that they were going to do to accommodate the census. Number three, you had to send out all the, the soldiers to enforce this. This was not like a one or two or three week thing, okay? This was a big event. It probably took, I mean, and this is just me speculating, it probably took a good hefty six months to get this done, okay? So they were count, the soldiers were probably in Bethlehem and these other regions for months and months and months counting people, making sure they didn't double count people and so on and so on. This was still not, not an easy thing. More than likely, they both hung out in Nazareth for a little while and then left for Bethlehem. If you look at a map between Nazareth and Bethlehem, it doesn't seem that bad. But what is, be if, and I don't have a map of this, I probably should have got it, gotten it, but Sumeria is between Nazareth and Bethlehem. Question, do the Jews have an issue with Samaria? What, what issue do they have? Yep, they, yep, they don't even talk to each other. Remember when Jesus was at the well, the woman at the well, she was a Samaritan, okay? She was from Samaria. This was a no-no. This was a no-no area. We don't go through Samaria. More than likely, they went around Samaria. They took the common trade routes around Samaria, which would have been, which would have added quite a bit to the trip. It would have probably taken around 80 miles. Four to eight days, depending on how fast they're traveling. So, you know, a good, we'll, we'll say, we'll round it up. We'll say a good 10 days to get out there. It's not bad, you know, not even, not even two weeks. The census was a point of contention, though, for skeptics. And this I didn't know. When I started looking into this, the, the census, every, everybody was, no, the census never happened. It couldn't have happened. This isn't something that, and now it's just like, it's a no-brainer. Well, well, yeah, they've been doing censuses. Kings have been doing censuses for literally thousands of years. Every kingdom does it. Well, why do they do that? Well, because ever since the invention of taxes, they want to make sure they're getting their fair share. 
By the way, yeah. By the way, kids, it'll happen to you. You're, you're gonna, you'll have to pay census. <laughs> Unfair share, I like that. So the, the census was a point of contention until much evidence was found, and now it's a no-brainer. But Mary was no longer a dependency of her family. And this is the, this is the purpose in, in a census, guys. Mary was no longer a dependency. She now had to be the dependency for Joseph's family, right? So now the taxes would have shifted. This is just normal. So Joseph, okay, so question. Why did Joseph go to Bethlehem? For the census, but why Bethlehem? That his, his family's from there. But go a step further, his family is there. It's not he happened to be born there and then moved away. That's not how the Jewish families worked back then. It was not common for a man to... Remember, remember when I told you about the Jewish tradition about he would build a home, right, in his father's house, and then he would go out and get his bride. This, is, this was the common thing. But if he was originally from Bethlehem, if that was where his core family was, that means that he had family in Bethlehem. That doesn't mean he was, like, I don't know. We, we think about it today, like, okay, I, uh, like, there, and there are laws around, around the world like this. If I happen to be born in China on my family's vacation, I could technically be a Chinese citizen. Okay, there are laws in many, many of the countries that do this. Not back then. Where was your family from? It didn't matter where you were born. Where you were physically born was irrelevant to the point. What, was, what mattered was where was your family from? His family was from there. Ooh, good question. That's a really good question. We, uh, scripture doesn't say why he, why he was left there. Oh, go ahead. No, no. She, she's asking why did he leave Bethlehem? Why did he leave Bethlehem to move to Nazareth originally? We don't actually know. But there's, and it wasn't uncommon for that to happen. It wasn't uncommon for a man to move away because he could have had other family there. But if his core family, if his father's family was from Bethlehem, then that was his, that was his, his core family. That means Bethlehem was where he was from. And he had family there. But we don't actually know. That's a good question, though. That I, I couldn't dive into. Uh, Mary would have been, Mary, what this means is this, okay? And this is, this is my point in bringing this up, guys. Mary did not go there, and she, Mary and Joseph were not alone. Please understand this. This is part of the, the point of contention. We get this idea that Mary and Joseph were walking into a town full of strangers. They were walking into a town full of family. They would have gone to their family's homes. Remember that courtyard I told you about? Where they would build a home, 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 home. And there was a central meeting area called the courtyard. And it was usually between all of the houses of the home, of the family members. They would have gone to family members' homes. So hold on, what is this whole thing with the whole meeting of, the, the, there was no room in the inn? This one blew me away. Check this out. This is a first century Jewish home. Okay? This is actually in heart. Well, actually, they, they took it down. The reason I was able to get this is because they were actually taking this, this uh, display down out of their, out of their uh, museum. So what this is, is this is a first century Jewish home. Okay? The living quarters was up at the top. That's where they lived. That was the normal, if you will, for modern days, it would be our living room. The bottom part of it, this is where you, you stored your food, you did cooking, this is where you would do a lot of your work. Uh, this is where uh, the animals at night, you would pull in from the fields and bring them in. Uh, do not think for a moment that all Jewish families had hundreds and hundreds and thousands of sheep. Don't think that. Disabuse your mind of that. When they say they were sleeping out in the fields with their, with their sheep, probably the common home only had like 20, if they were fairly wealthy, 30 or 40 sheep. They kept sheep for sacrifices, wool, milk, meat, okay? That, that was the common thing. But your normal family didn't need thousands like Abraham, okay? So there would have been plenty of space down there to house their animals, if not mo most or all of their animals. Tr Christian tradition, the, actually should say Christmas tradition, um, 
usually says, okay, they, they were forced to go into a cave. They were forced to go into a barn, right? Well, the barn, okay, was the downstairs. It was part of the house. If he went there, he would have not gone to an inn in the sense that we think of a commercial inn. Check this out. You can look this up. This is in Strong's Concordance, G2646, if you want a reference. This is the Greek word, kataluma. Okay? The Greek word kataluma can be translated place of lodging, uh, inn, guest chamber. Now, by the way, when I say place of lodging, I literally mean the sleeping place, the place to sleep. When Joseph and Mary got to Bethlehem, they didn't have enough room because guess what? All of their family's homes were filled. They already had the top room were filled. But as we'll find out in just a minute, and I'll, I'll, I'll dr- jump right over in just a minute, about the sheep, the flocks going out, they're watching over their flocks by night. Why do you think they were watching over their flocks by night? Critters, wolves, right. Why were, out, why were they out there? Why didn't they have their... their... Oh! Their houses were full. There was no room for the animals. Because of this census. I really hope this is shifting your perspective, guys. Remember when we watched the movie? They, were, they went from in to in to in. And there's no room, there's no room, there's no room. Commercial inns were rare and few and far between back then, guys. They were not a common thing. We think about it today. We go to a small town like Mayo, Michigan, and we have, what, two motels? Three? Small little town like Mayo, Michigan, we have hotels. Back then, this was a rarity, very big rarity. So, huh? No Motel 6. They went and they stayed with family. This is why he went there. Now, the whole thing with the manger, finding him in the manger, that whole thing, the way that they would typically build those homes is they would build either a wooden, typically it was a stone, but a wooden trough in the, in the downstairs for that exact thing. But if everybody's gone, if all the animals are gone, the upstairs is full, the downstairs is practically full, well, guess what? They have, what are their only option for a crib? A manger, this is their only option, okay? And one thing I want, I want to make very clear, Mary, when they got there, Mary was not, in labor on the way there. She would have gotten there because it says, I'm going to lose the verse now. Um, I did lose my verse. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Swaddling clothes. Uh, Swaddling clothes... And I used to swaddle our kids. Swaddling clothes are very, very, very tight. Okay? You wrap the child very tight. And I actually had to look it up when I became a father and learned how to do this. Uh, You had to wrap them very tight so they didn't scratch their face or scratch their eyes or anything like that. And it helped them stay warm. So it was swaddling clothes was something that was wrapped very, very tightly around them. Mm-hmm. So it said, but it says though, when, when Mary got there, it says that her time came. That doesn't mean that she arrived and boom, the baby came out. It means she was there, she was hanging out with family, and she had girls there to help her give birth. I, I just, I'm trying to really repaint this picture in your mind because if we look at the historical context here, guys, this is, this is a different story. Now, we know the story of the shepherds. Jasper read it. The story of the shepherds watching over their flocks by night would have needed to do this because there was no room in the kataluma. There was no room in the guest rooms. There was no room in the homes. All of the animals were outside, so they would have taken shifts every night watching over their flocks. Some of them were probably Joseph's own family. Keep that in mind. So I want, I want to paint this picture. Now, we cannot pull this out in Scripture. I'm kind of reading between the lines, but imagine this. If you're staying with it, let's say Mary and Joseph stayed with the family for three weeks. Just toss out a number. Three weeks before then. 
Don't you think the story, don't you think some mention of the Messiah, something would have been brought up about the, the coming one, right? The one that's supposed to save your people would have came up. So they could have been Joseph's own family out there in the fields talking about this stuff when the angel arrived. Who knows if Joseph and Mary could have confided in some of the family members. We don't know. But those angels were sent out by God to proclaim the coming Messiah to those who would listen. And I think that's what's important here. Those who would listen, they went out to. So, that was, and the shepherds, obviously, we know the story. Many of us do, at least. The story, they came in and they, they celebrated with the star. Oh, I'm sorry, they, the family said, hey, you got to go in. You're going to find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And that's how they found them. But in Matthew 2, it talks about, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I already read that one. Um, it talks about the wise men. So, uh, when it talks about the wise men, here's something also that, that I dug up and I, I, I found very interesting. So, the wise men, the word that they used, they shifted and they changed. When they talk about the wise men, they started using the Greek word pedonion, P-A-I-D-I-O-N, which means infant or young child up to the age of seven. They could have used the Greek word brephos. The word brephos means baby, means a newborn, means a, a baby baby. Like brephos, brephos is a child, we would consider it a baby that cannot like do anything, right? Like cannot be left alone for five minutes. You have to be there with them all the time kind of thing outside of when you lay them down to rest. Uh, they could have used that word, but they didn't. They used pedonian. They used the, 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 what we would consider a child that can walk, an infant, right? A mobile child, right? They could have used it. Pedonian actually was used 51 times all throughout Scripture. Jesus used it. Remember when Jesus took a child from the, from the crowd, put him in the middle and said, you got to be like this young child? Guess what word they used? Pedonian. They used an infant, a young child, under the age of seven, and they put that in there. And he put them in the middle, and then they started talking about them. So Jesus would have been around, and we don't know the exact age, but possibly around a year old by the time the wise men got, got around to it. These wise men were probably high-ranking officials. Uh, we don't know how many there were. We always say there's three based upon what? The gifts, absolutely. But we, if truth be told, we don't actually know. But the interesting thing is, is when they would have came, Petra, what, if you're traveling from the east, Petra is just between the east and Israel. Guess what they sell in Petra? Frankincense and myrrh. They could have easily passed their caravan right through it and bought something like that. Now, these, these gifts are significant, obviously. These gifts, gold is meant to represent his kingliness, his kingship. Frankincense was his godness, his, his, his deity, his deity, because um, uh, frankincense was an incense. It was something that you would burn in the temple, right? And myrrh was an embalming uh, element, so meaning his, his uh, death as well. So, part three, the escape. So, Herod the Great, uh, Herod the Great, by the way, was great, not because he was awesome. Herod the Great was great because he was terrible. <laughs> he, did, he did terrible, terrible things. Uh, yeah, he, yeah, it was just absolutely terrible things, guys. I, I don't even want to get into it. One of the things, or a couple of things, I'll, I will say this. He locked up his own children and killed many of them because he was afraid they were trying to usurp him. Okay, so what Herod the Great did um, was the wise men, and many of us know this story, the wise men came there, but here's the thing, Herod would have probably found out the moment that the wise men left that the wise men cheated him because the wise men would have probably came in an armed caravan. If they were high-ranking officials, they would have not been, which in the movie The Star, they're, they're 
riding camels by themselves, three wise men. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. And here's the thing, Herod, and this is why, this is why we know that there's something official about this because they were so high ranking, Herod didn't want to mess with them. They had to have had either some protection, political protection, physical protection, or something because Herod, I guarantee you, would not have hesitated to kill them, finding out that they betrayed him. But they had something that would have prevented Herod from touching them. And physical protection, right. The prophecies about Jesus would have been told to them uh, that he was born in Bethlehem. This is how they knew he was born in Bethlehem. Based on how many people, though, uh, and we, we all know, we know the story of, of what Herod did. Herod killed all the baby children, right? Based upon the census and all of the people around that area, around the Bethlehem area, they would have been around 6,000 people. Now, I'm not downplaying what he did. I just want to give you full perspective. It would have probably been around 50 babies died. That's still an atrocity, okay? But I just want, I don't want you to think that it was thousands of kids died, okay? There were probably only six or 7,000 people in the area at the time. But still, nonetheless. And they, they, as they returned, Herod the Great died, and this is, this is the time frame that, that I, I kind of, it was, it was very hard to pinpoint this time frame. When you look up the Herod, Herod the Great, I get between 4 and 3 BC when he died. Okay? Jesus was no more, when he returned, he was no more than probably four, maybe six years old when he returned. Maybe, based upon the dates. Which means that they were not in Egypt for a long, 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 long time. Okay? He died, if he died in around 3 BC, and Jesus was born around 6 B.C., which the best records indicate that he was born around 6 B.C., then do the math, that's only like three years apart. Which would mean that they would have... Scripture, scripture tells us, I don't have time to finish reading it, but Scripture tells us that the moment that Herod died, an angel came down and said, hey, listen, Herod's gone. Now, mind you, yeah, his son's in, in place, and that kind of freaked Joseph out a little bit, but Herod's gone now. You can come back. You could go back. And so they returned. But now I, I understand that birthdays... And, and Okay, so the big question... Okay, so when was Jesus' birthday? When was Jesus' birthday? We, we don't actually know. We, we don't. We celebrated on Christmas, and that's fine. But did you know that birthdays were actually not a thing until probably about... I don't know, I want to say it was around 250 years ago. Do you know that? Yeah. The only people that would celebrate birthdays would be the elite, high elite, like kings' birthdays would be celebrated. It was the middle class, once middle class, about two, three hundred years ago, really started ramping up. People were able to have the money to have parties and stuff like that. Life, 2,000 years ago, guys, was about survival. It was not about celebrating holidays, Okay. Now, God set up holidays for them to celebrate. Don't misunderstand it. Absolutely. But I'm just saying two to 300 years ago is when birthdays actually started being celebrated. According to the best estimates, Jesus was probably born in late summer, early fall-ish. Based also upon the fact that he died, what, what year or what month did he die in? What was that? Yep, around April-ish. It was Pentecost, right? It was around those celebrations of when he died. How long was his ministry? Three and a half. So we can kind of estimate from about his death, go back six months-ish. Okay. Now, I don't believe the Bible's down to the day in some things. I think it gives us years for a reason because there's a little bit of a flex there. Um, But anyway... My, my whole point is, okay, so Justin, why, what's the point in all this? Why are you bringing up these details? Some of these details I already know. I know. Some of us don't know this. Some of us get a, a fake picture of the way that it was when Jesus was, came into this world, okay? Let me read something from Desire of Ages. In the fields, in the fields where the boy David had led his flock, shepherds were still keeping watch by night. Through the silent hours, they talked through 
They talked together of the promised Savior and prayed for the coming of the king to David's throne. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel of the Lord, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring to you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. At these words, visions of glory filled the minds of the listening shepherds. The deliverer has come to Israel. Power, exaltation, triumph are associated with this coming. But the angel must prepare them to recognize their Savior in poverty and humiliation. This shall be a sign unto you, he said. Hold on, guys. Ye shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. The heavenly messenger had quieted their fears. He had told them how to find Jesus with tender regard for their human weakness. He had given them time to become accustomed to the divine radiance. Then the joy and glory could now, sorry, could no longer be hidden. The whole plain was lighted up with the bright shining of the host of God. Earth was hushed and heaven stooped to listen to the song. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Oh, that today the human family could recognize that song. The declaration that then made, the note then struck, will swell to the close of time and resound to the ends of the earth. When the sun of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, then song will be echoed by the voice of a great multitude as the voice of many waters saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Knowing the birth of Christ and his story, it's, it's great. It really is. It's wonderful. But it means nothing if we don't answer the call of why he came. I wanted to go through this because I wanted to give us a little bit of a clarity of the, the birth of Christ. Some of us may have known this. Some of us may not have. And that's perfectly fine. But the point is, is that without Emmanuel, God with us, we, we just have a story. We have a legend. We just have a story of an amazing baby being born and doing stuff. But if he is actually Emmanuel, if he is the one that God sent to reconnect humanity to God, and that, mm, that means so much more. That means so much more. Let me pray very quickly and we can, we can sing our closing song. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. I pray, Jesus, once again, Lord, that during this holiday season, you will send someone into our lives, Father, that we can share this message with. Some of these details, Father, they'd be great icebreakers to bring to people about the true Christian, or I'm sorry, about this, the true story of Jesus, uh, surrounding Jesus' birth, Lord. There's so many elements. I pray, Father, that you continue to give us wisdom on these elements and be able to share them with others. Now, as we continue on with our service, Lord, please bless it and use us. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you'll help us to recognize during this, during this Christmas holiday the true reason for the season, which is recognizing your son's birth. We love you so much and we thank you. Pray this in your heavenly name. Amen.